Welcome to Matters With. I'm your host, Philip Bryan, and I'm here to discuss entertainment and historical matters with you. Pilot, poet, Broadway star, and silver screen icon, James Maitland Stewart. Jimmy. <laughs> Pennsylvania born in 1908 to Alex and Elizabeth as the oldest of three, Jimmy enjoyed an upper middle class childhood. His mother was a musician and a pillar of the community. His father served in World War I during a few of Jimmy's formative years. The elder Stuart returned home safely to his wife and children and to once again run the family business, a popular hardware store. Jimmy eyed his dad's service with great reverence. The Jimmy Stewart Museum states that young Jimmy was described as a, a daydreamer who spent much of his time building model airplanes and dreaming of aviation. In high school, Jimmy was in the glee club and on the track team as a high jumper. He also played a bit of football. His graduation was delayed due to a bout of scarlet fever. During this time, Jimmy was riveted by the accomplishments of Charles Lindbergh, the first person to solo pilot nonstop from New York to Paris. Jimmy built a representation of the flight in the window of his father's hardware store. He would take a little plane and move it across the cardboard globe as the information and updates came in over the newswire. In 1928, Jimmy began his learning career at Princeton. He studied architecture and joined Princeton's prestigious theater group, the Triangle Club. His senior architectural thesis was an airport design. And what does one do with a Princeton degree with honors in architecture and a scholarship in hand for grad school? Broadway, of course. Well, there was one stop before the lights of Broadway. Jimmy jaunted on up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts and joined the University Players Summer Stock Theater program as a musician. But soon he was on the stage as an actor and they were taking their show to Broadway. James Stewart made his Broadway debut on October 29, 1932. The show wasn't well received, but Broadway had an affinity for Jimmy. He for it. The play closed after a month Jimmy stayed. He and fellow university player Henry Fonda rented a tiny apartment and pursued their dreams. Henry Fonda reportedly stated that Jimmy could walk in, say a few words, not know the lines, and producers would offer him a role. Fonda regarded this as impressive, but also a bit frustrating. If you want to know more about the adventures and lifelong friendship of James Stewart and Henry Fonda, I recommend Hank and Jim by Scott Iman. There's a link for it in the description of this video. The lights of Broadway were bright. But within a few short years, the lights of Hollywood and the brass at MGM took notice and called his name. In 1935, he got his first credited role in a feature-length film, The Murder Man, starring Spencer Tracy. Jimmy, the six-foot-three and some change newcomer, played a reporter named Shorty. Within that same year, he also got his commercial pilot's license and bought his first plane. It would not be long before Jimmy moved from bit player to supporting standout to leading man. By 1938, he was headlining films, and he got his first Oscar nomination for 1939's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I stand guilty as trained, because Section 40 is graft, and I was ready to say so. I was ready to tell you that a certain man in my state, a Mr. James Taylor, wanted to put through this dam for his own profit. A man who controls a political machine and controls everything else worth controlling in my state. Yes, and a man even powerful enough to control congressmen. And I saw three of them in his room the day I went up to see him. The Senator, you must, sir. I will not yield. He did not take home the trophy that night. A year later, he was nominated again. His fellow nominees were Charlie Chaplin, Raymond Massey, Lawrence Olivier, and his best friend, Henry Fonda, who was nominated for the Grapes of Wrath. Stewart won the Best Actor Academy Award for his role as Macaulay Mike Connor in The Philadelphia Story. But of course, women like to romanticize about things. Yes, they do, don't they? Yes, they do, don't they? I don't know. I, I can't understand how you can have been married to her and still know so little about her. Can't you? No, I can't you. <laughs> I have the hiccups. I wonder if I might have another drink. Certainly. The Oscar was then proudly displayed in the window of his family's hardware store back in Pennsylvania. This is where the path of Jimmy's life takes an unexpected turn. James Stewart, box office star who was the toast of the town and many starlets, joined what is now the United States Air Force. The 32-year-old was drafted in October of 1940. He failed to make weight and could have simply returned to his lifestyle as a Hollywood A-lister without missing a beat, but instead he hit the gym, put on the weight, 
and got in the best shape of his life. And then he headed out to be a bomber pilot. Stewart flew 20 official missions over Germany and became a highly respected officer, leader, and hero. Stewart didn't speak much of his time in combat, but his record and the respect of those who served alongside or under him speaks volumes. Including, but not limited to, the Distinguished Service Medal, the Army Air Force Commendation Medal, and the Distinguished Flying Cross with Oak Leaf Cluster. When he returned to the States, he had it written into his contract that his time in the service could not be used as part of any film's publicity campaign. Stewart transferred to the reserves, more on that later, and returned to his film career. It was late 1945, and having not yet decided what his next film project would be, Jimmy's phone rang. It was Frank Capra, who had directed Stewart and You Can't Take It With You, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Capra was offering him a part in a movie that was having serious book adaptation issues. It had been rewritten several times and had lost the original intended star, Cary Grant. The film would be 1946's It's a Wonderful Life. Stewart had not made a movie in over five years. The role was a beast of beats and changes. He would play George Bailey, a talented and optimistic good man who over the course of 17 years is transformed into a man seemingly on the last rung of sanity, not only due to the never-ending plight and pressures of life, but also because of the schemes and manipulation of those in positions of influence and power. It is a dark and dramatic, yet emotionally hopeful tale that, in my opinion, features the silver screen legend's best acting. Look at the contrast of these clips as the character's view of the world changes. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and next year and a year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. And then I'm going to build things. I'm at the end of my rope. I... Show me the way. The film had a big opening, but it fell off quickly, possibly due to the themes of loss and struggle not being palatable to audiences so soon after World War II. Jimmy gained his third Oscar nomination for the role of George Bailey. In the decades since, the film has become a tremendous success. It is widely regarded as one of the best movies ever made. The Library of Congress has named it a culturally and historically significant work. In 1949, James Stewart married Gloria Hattrick McLean and adopted her two sons from a previous marriage. Two years later, they had twin daughters. The Stewarts kept a low profile and stayed out of Hollywood gossip. According to the Chicago Tribune, Jimmy said this about Gloria. I could tell right off. For me, it had been love at first sight. She was the kind of girl... I had always dreamed of. During the late 40s, Jimmy reestablished himself as a box office draw and an acclaimed actor. Yet in the 50s and 60s, he somehow excelled to new levels, starring in comedies, dramas, thrillers, and westerns. Massive hits. In the 1957 film The Spirit of St. Louis, Jimmy got to play the man he had looked up to so much during his high school years, Charles Lindbergh. His career was prolific and epically successful. I wanted to see you hang. I wanted to see you go gradually madder and madder and madder until the day finally came when you were going to hang. She, is that, uh, well, I certainly am surprised. Is that that? Oh, you're the golden girl, Tracy. Full of life and warmth and delight. But I just want you to know that I've been flying for quite some time now. And it hasn't always been for crummy outfits like this one. This rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community. Well, is it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? By what right do you dare say that there's a superior few to which you belong? You all seem to know about this fellow Liberty Valance. He's a no-good, gun-packing, murdering thief. In this world, Elwood, you must be oh so smart or all oh, so pleasant. Well, for years I was smart. I recommend pleasant. I mentioned earlier that It's a Wonderful Life is listed with the Library of Congress as culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Well, as of this recording, only 825 films that have ever been produced, ever in the history of ever, only 825 films have been bestowed that honor. 
12 of them are Jimmy Stewart films. That is a significant creative accomplishment if I have ever seen one. Yet, as I'm sure you've already gleaned, his story doesn't revolve around his astounding career as one of the greatest ever at his chosen craft. Let's go back to war. The World War II pilot was now a brigadier general and had kept his service in the Air Force separate from his public film career. In recent years, more and more of his time in service to the country has become part of public awareness, such as in February of 1966, James Stewart visited Vietnam to conduct an extended inspection. While there, the general opted to participate in a combat mission in a B-52. Captain Bob Amos said that he was surprised to see Brigadier General Stewart listed as an extra pilot for their next mission. Here is a photo of Captain Amos, his crew, and General Stewart after the 12-hour mission. On May 31, 1968, General Stewart retired from the Air Force after 27 years, 2 months, and 9 days. However, war wasn't done with him. Lieutenant Ron McLean, glorious son, his stepson, was killed in action in Vietnam. He was ambushed near the DMZ. The Stewarts were beyond devastated. Jimmy did what he usually did. He dealt with it privately and went back to work. Throughout the 70s, now a living Hollywood legend, Jimmy made several more films, appeared on television often, and returned to Broadway. In the 80s, he was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, made a lot more television appearances, and penned a best-selling book of poetry. His final film credit was in the 1991 sequel to An American Tale, titled Fievel Goes West. James Maitland Stewart passed away at home in 1997, three years after his beloved wife of 44 years. According to his children, his final words were, I'm going to be with Gloria now. Jimmy Stewart left a legacy. We have a huge catalog of quality films, television, and stories he left behind. His name is synonymous with great acting as well as exceptional screen and stage presence. At the local dinner theater, there's an autographed picture of Jimmy Stewart that hangs in the lobby. I don't know who put it there, and I don't know when. I never asked. What I do know is that it served as a reminder that Jimmy was an actor's actor. That's an understatement. James Stewart was a writer's actor, a critic's actor, a director's actor, a producer's actor, and most of all, an audience's actor. Hero, poet, pilot, Broadway star, silver screen icon, and general. And finally, the audience. All you wonderful folks out there, thank, thank you for being so kind to me over the years. You've given me a wonderful life. God bless you.